I'm going to talk about resilience, something we all want, and it seems to be a good thing to have. But how do you get it, and how do you know when you have it? I'll show you what we learn about that from marine ecosystems. I study the sea. You can imagine the roar of the sea. And I'm going to start at the beach, more particularly at the car park at the beach, because recently I arrived at the beach to go for a surf. That's work for me. And I overheard the woman getting out of the next car. I couldn't really help but overhear. She was shouting. She was saying to her children in the back seat, you just push me and push me and push me until you push me over the edge. And that concept is important for what I want to show you about building resilience. Those children may draw up the situation like this. There's the sound you were imagining before. Those children may draw the situation up like this. On one scale, the level of their mother's serenity, calm and serene at the top. And on the other scale, the level of their own annoying behaviour. Now, these kids might be annoying. They're also a tad geeky because they've drawn it up as a graph. And what the graph shows is that as their annoying behaviour continues and increases, so at first the mother's apparent serenity level, at least on the surface, doesn't change a lot. Until it gets to a point, a tipping point, and then it drops dramatically. And then after that it doesn't change much because whatever the children are doing, by now mum is pretty much furious through and through. Resilience is about spending more time at the top of this graph. Put simply, if you're knocked down, resilience is about getting back up, dusting yourself off and going again. Or more generally, it's the ability of something that you want to hold on to, to cope with major external change and carry on functioning. But it is notoriously difficult to measure or to pin down this thing, resilience. And there are a couple of things on this slide that we might measure, but they don't pin resilience down. They don't define it very well. And one is the mother's level of serenity. We might potentially measure that, but what we'll find is that it's either high or low. That won't tell us whether it's anywhere near to a point of rapid change. And the other scale is fascinating. It turns out that as the children diminish or abate their annoying behaviour, the point at which the mother gets her mojo back is not the same point at which she lost it in the first place. Well, that's interesting in itself, but it also means that on that scale, if we were to measure at the midpoint, right there in the middle, the mother might either be totally calm and serene or totally not. We wouldn't have any idea. Mostly we learn about resilience when we no longer have it. Letting things fail is a surefire method for testing resilience. But in a society, for example, to let parts of the community crash and burn simply so we know whether they had had resilience is far too dire. And we need a better indicator, an earlier measure than that. So how do we know when we have resilience and how can we go about getting more of it? Well, resilience is sought in many disciplines. And just by way of example, our personal health, our families, our schools, our communities, and in our businesses, and the global economy, and in the world's major ecosystems, my interest. And it's sought after because the things we like are affected by external changes changes in technology, population increase, and decline in places, health epidemics, natural disasters, changes in climate, in legislation, in business trends, and even wars and terrorism. And resilience, you see it called for everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean geographically everywhere, but also across so many different disciplines. There's a common seeking, a common thread here, and a couple that caught my eye. 
boy six needs help developing his resilience. That seemed an awfully tough call to me. I tried to remember back to when I was a boy of six. If I remember rightly, uh, I was just getting the hang of my own shoelaces. Uh, so I definitely needed help with resilience. Probably still do today. And here's another one. Champions Chelsea need to find their old resilience. They had it, and they lost it, and they need to get it back. That's possibly true, but it also shows there's an interesting perspective to resilience. If in the English football you, you support Manchester United instead, then I doubt you'd find this particular sort of resilience a very attractive proposition. But when we do want resilience, how can we go about attaining it? Well, I'll show you what we learned from the ecosystems. We've learned a lot by studying coral reefs. But it's that lesser known habitat alongside that I'm going to talk about, seagrass. And seagrasses form vast underwater meadows. They're the prairies of the sea, highly productive. They uh, protect the coastline. They are habitat for cool things like turtles. They support fisheries. They even store carbon. They do it all. But the truth is they're nowhere near as vast as they once were. The industrial and urban development of our coastlines has seen to that. In fact, they're being lost more quickly at a faster rate than tropical rainforests. But being underwater, to some extent, they're out of sight and out of mind. But we need to do something about it. When we lose seagrass, what do we get in its place? A muddy bottom, uh, but not that sort of a muddy bottom. A muddy sea floor, a muddy sea floor that has no vegetation. And that none of the wonderful characteristics that seagrass provides. And it turns out that some seagrass meadows are more resilient than others just as some humans are more resilient than others, some economies. For seagrass, we set out to learn why. What's their secret? Many researchers had already tried to tackle this problem, but the wonderful thing about being at a university is that there are always bright young students coming through with new ideas, new approaches, and this work is led by a student, Paul. And according to the gospel of this Paul, the key aspects of resilience are something called internal feedback loops. And the key part to measure, if you want to pin down resilience, internal feedback loops. Internal feedback loops. I'll come back to those. But first, to know about resilience in seagrass, we had to see how this habitat would respond to major disturbance. Paul's part of a team at the university studying resilience. And we were sitting as a group in the lab trying to figure out what could challenge the seagrass ecosystem on a grand scale and with different intensities in different places. When we were interrupted by a torrential tropical downpour, so loud on the roof that we could no longer hear ourselves think. And we ended up disbanding and going home and we didn't have a solution. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And it rained for five days hard. It was the biggest rainfall event in these parts for 40 years. And it caused an almighty flood. And that stripped the soil from the land and pushed the muddy water out. And this is an action shot now. Out through the bay, past that island, and out to sea. Quite literally, it turned the blue water brown. That's very bad for plants such as seagrasses because they need light to penetrate the water so that they can grow. So what will we measure in seagrasses that will get a handle on this resilience? Let me remind you what we won't measure. I'll go back to the children's slide. I said that measuring the mother's serenity level would be either high or low, but it wouldn't really tell us whether it was close to a point of rapid change. Well, it turns out this slide equally applies to seagrass ecosystems. All I have to do is change the labels. So now it's flood impact, the amount of dirty brown water that arrives, and the amount of seagrass on the other scale. 
and measuring the amount of seagrass, it's traditionally done, and it might be something that's fairly straightforward to measure, but it won't tell us anything about whether that seagrass meadow is resilient or not. We need to focus on these internal feedback loops. One of the key internal feedback loops in this seagrass ecosystem is the ability of a seagrass meadow to actually trap mud from the water and hold it on the seabed. And in doing so, in clearing the mud, it allows more light to penetrate and therefore it can grow more and therefore it can trap more mud. So if you see then that's a cycle, it's a feedback loop of ever increasing recovery. Once we worked all that out, we measured it at many different meadows over the 12 months following the flood. There's a lot of technical detail in behind all of that, unimaginable technical detail that we had to get right. But you can think of it for today as a straightforward science project, so long as one can work underwater in near zero visibility. It's a straightforward science project. Seagrass meadows that turned out to be resilient showed an incredibly striking pattern. As the flood impact was greater, so resilient meadows simply worked harder. They cleared more mud from the water column. That's the pattern, the striking signal for resilient meadows. For non-resilient meadows, they showed a different pattern. They were okay at low levels of flood impact, but failed at high levels. And the result was interesting. Meadows of seagrass that were near to the mouths of the rivers that had originally brought the flood water. We had, we had meadows there, but we also had meadows further out to sea that never really received so much flood water. And it was the meadows near the river mouths that proved to be the most resilient. And that's possibly because they had, possibly, in previous years faced small doses, small pulses of brown river water. Nothing like the flood, but small pulses. And if that's true, it's starting to sound like the tough love model of resilience that some psychologists talk about. Now, I'm not advocating that we deliberately damage pristine seagrass beds. We would lose aspects of the biodiversity if we did that. That's a bad idea. But measuring the feedback loops turns out to be a very good way of pinning down resilience. If you're still a bit fuzzy about what resilience is, if you find it all about as clear as mud, Identify the feedback loops and all will be revealed. All will become clear. And I, I know that feedback loops at first can be a bit hard to love, a bit hard to get familiar with, so I'll give you another example from a different discipline. Economics. The link between business profits and wages. Profits down, so wages contract, ultimately. Uh, thereby stoking profits. So there's a feedback loop. And it's the speed with which that response happened, the speed with which wages change in response to profits and profits in response to wages, that confers resilience on a business or on a whole economy. For whatever it is that you want to see succeed, identify the feedbacks and find ways to nurture them. For resilience, feed the feedbacks. And I want to end with two very short lines from a song. Some of you might know it as the hippopotamus song. Although I have changed the second line. Mud, mud, glorious mud. Feedbacks revealed in the midst of the flood. Thank you. I won't give up my day job. <laughs>